So let me uh, say that my involvement in this project and in uh, reviewing the permit and going through the permitting, uh, seeing how the permitting process works with DNR, uh, all was a result of uh, being active with the Alaska Quiet Rights Coalition. Um, and uh, we believe the coalition, just to give a little of uh, what it does, um, we believe that natural sounds, natural quiet are resources of our public lands, in a little, um, and that deserve protection, uh, very similar to how we treat uh, uh, clean water and clean air. Uh, we seek a fair and balanced allocation of areas and trails on our public lands for the quiet recreationists, the non-motorized recreations. We do this work, uh, and the work we do is primarily reviewing land use plans and reviewing uh, applications for permits similar to this. Uh, primarily, we we're writing letters, but we also testify at public hearings and, of course, meet uh, with uh, public land officials to uh, discuss our issues. Uh, our interest in quiet recreation is so that when you go and use public lands, you can experience natural quiet and can hear natural sounds. So one, um, uh, I did put some brochures out. If anyone's interested, we of course always welcome membership. Um, or you can check out our website to see what we commented on and the kinds of things that we comment about. And before we start, I just want to say one thing. Uh, AQRC commented on this permit when it was pending and we opposed it. Uh, we subsequently appealed uh, the decision to grant the permit asking that it be rescinded. So you know where I'm coming from. Okay, what we're going to do is uh, review the plans for the world's longest watercraft jet ski race, uh, review the permit issued by the Division of Mining, Land, and Water of DNR, review the objections uh, raised by groups and uh, some of the appeal points, and then take questions. That's coming up. Okay, the route of this race starts in starts in Whittier, uh, comes comes around into Prince William Sound, goes into Cook Inlet, uh, comes down, comes around uh, Kodiak, um, cuts across then through the Shilakoff uh, Straits, is then on the east side of the Alaska Peninsula goes through at False Pass and goes then up the uh, west side of the peninsula, ending in Ileana Lake, providing that it's not frozen uh, next year. So what is this? These are um, photographs from the, from the website. Uh, according to their web website, it's the world's longest, toughest watercraft race, one-of-a-kind event, do things never before attempted, watercrafting event of a lifetime. The race is being promoted as the toughest, roughest, endurance jet ski race in the world. So what do we actually know about the details of the race? A uh, 1,000 participants. Uh, and they must race in two-person teams, so there'd be 500 teams. Uh, correcting uh, the trivia question, it's a $35,000 entry fee for each person. Uh, the first prize is a million dollars to each of the two team members of the first team, and with uh, two million dollars being uh, distributed to the next 50 uh, top participants. There are 20 plus um, checkpoints. There are over 110 private boats uh, are to be hired by the wet dog uh, organization and to be located along the route uh, for safety purposes. The race is to start this next May 1st. And just I think a little about what May 1st was like this year or even the rest of the month uh, today, except today, 
uh, would you want to be on a jet ski um, at that time? The race is expected to take uh, five to uh, seven days. They will start in Whittier in waves, three waves of uh, 35 teams per wave, which translates, uh, going every two minutes, which translates into 210 racers a day will leave the Whittier uh, uh, Harbor, and that then means if there in fact are a thousand racers, it will take uh, basically five days to get this race out of the Whittier Harbor, and each day it takes will take like three and a half hours if in fact it works like clockwork and it goes every two minutes. So every day for the first first or the first five days uh, uh, starting May first will be out of going out of Whittier, uh, but it will take that 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 amount of time. And the other thing to keep in mind is that the sponsor does believe that it will take 500 gallons per jet ski uh, to do the 1,000 miles. So let's look at a different uh, kind of map. The green area shows the marine protected areas through which the uh, race will, will go. Um, so keep that in mind. And then I would point you also to the map, and there's some handouts of that map that Audubon, Alaska has done, which shows that the seabird colonies and the globally significant important bird areas in the vicinity of the race. Um, that's an important map to take a copy of if you're interested. Um, so, on the next slide. Um, Again, uh, from their website, the Alaskan wet dog race is taking PWC personal watercraft racing to an entirely new level of extreme and is changing the entire belief that jet skis can only operate in a river or on the lake. Another quote, ocean riding is where it's at. We are busting the paradigm that PWCs are only thrill craft and are a river or lake lock. To put that in perspective, in this country, the longest continuous endurance race is 300 miles on Lake Havasu in Arizona. It's a man-made lake, and it's a 10-mile 10, 10 circuit that they do. The longest ocean race that is conducted in this country is goes from Long Beach to Catalina Island and back, and that is a 56-mile race. We're talking about a 2,000 mile race in the ocean. This is a totally different kettle of fish. So let's get to the permit. Uh, Division of Mining Land and Water is uh, part of the uh, Department of Natural Resources. Its mission is to provide for the appropriate use and management of Alaska's uh, state owned land and water aimed towards maximum use consistent with the public interest. And you might want to keep that in mind. What is the public interest that will be served by this race? Uh, that's a copy of the, of the permit. It was initially filed uh, in October of 2011. Uh, there is a, was a public process that took place uh, then in this January 2012. Uh, 97 comments were received uh, my uh, quick flipping through them, I came up that 12 were in favor and 85 uh, against uh, uh, allowing that permit, granting that permit. Uh, the permit was, was issued in May of 2012. Uh, the memo of decision that led to the granting of the permit uh, granted a three-year uh, land use permit starting last May, uh, May 1st through the 31st from 2012, 13, 14, to the 15th. Um, I would say that the memo decision, uh, I want to give you a quote from that. Uh, the statement was made, the environmental risks associated with the proposed land use permit are minimal. 
risks may be minimized by the required uh, requirements described in the general and the, and the special stipulations. The general stipulations are, are boilerplate. There are special three special uh, per, uh, stipulations that we wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, first off, that the sponsor is must produce a performance bond of a thousand dollars. Now, mind you, we're talking about a thousand racers going two thousand miles in an unforgiving ocean. Uh, there is an annual permit fee of two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, and there is, of course, an insurance requirement. Uh, also required will be uh, before uh, 30 days before the race, they, the sponsor must submit a general safety plan and procedures um, uh, to DNR uh, for acceptance. There, as far as we know, however, there are no criteria uh, that specify what the plan must uh, uh, cover. So. The decision to grant the permit was uh, subsequently appealed uh, to Commissioner Sullivan uh, by 11 organizations and 12 individuals uh, who had uh, previously commented and then opposed it. This was a joint uh, appeal, and that was filed on uh, June 11 of last year. Uh, Audubon, Alaska Audubon also fired, filed a separate appeal uh, earlier that month in June, and we have not had any decision from the commissioner uh, yet. Let's say it's pending. Um, so, so now I wanted to go into some of the issues that were raised by the uh, commenters as, and, uh, and appeared in the appeal. Uh, overwhelmingly, the, uh, the comments related to the possible ad adverse effects on, on wildlife. Um, let me just run through a few of these. Talking about uh, seabirds um, and shorebirds. They would be, at this point, uh, breeding, nesting, feeding, um, they would be in colonies, uh, stellar eiders. It was concerned that they might still be in their wintering uh, uh, habitat. Black oyster catchers would be nesting. Uh, Merlet's uh, habitat would be trans. Uh, uh, jet skis would go through it, uh, and of course, migrating uh, shorebirds and waterfowl. And then there's the whole issue of mammals. Um, about being harassed, uh, where the behavior then is disrupted by the noise and the presence of uh, uh, jet skis, the, poss the actual possibility of collision, um, pollution concerns, and critical habitat um, affected. And we're of course talking uh, sea otters, uh, beluga whales, Lake Iliamna, the freshwater, uh, harbor seals, stellar sea lions, there's particular concern about the females who would be pregnant at that time and are unusually skittish. And of course, there's also the issue of the uh, <coughs> uh, rookeries and the haulouts. Uh, gray whales would be migrating, humpback whales would be foraging at that time, um, harbor seals would be raising their pups, and walruses, and we all know what happens when noise disrupts uh, walruses or startles wal walruses in haulots. Uh, there's yeah, a great deal of mortality. There's the issue of uh, the jet ski pollution on, on air and water and of course uh, the noise element which we'll get into in some detail. Um, concerns were raised about the adverse effects of these jet skis coming into and, and being in the uh, checkpoint communities. There's a question as to whether there will be any uh, impacts on the uplands all between the checkpoints. And of course, safety uh, is uh, also a prime concern. So let's get, let's get to the sound. Uh, these machines have to meet EPA standards. There's no question about that. But um, 
there is no acknowledgement in the processing yet or in the uh, responses that the sponsor gave to questions raised that we're talking not about a single machine, we're talking about multiple machines traveling at the highest possible sp speed over two weeks during prime nesting uh, season. The application and the processing, as far as I'm concerned, treats it as if it's just a jet ski and we can't, and therefore they, they can't be regulated in any fashion. There, of course, the, the effect of noise on humans, and if you just think of yourself, if you were out uh, kayaking uh, somewhere along the route, we are talking about a thousand jet skis going by. And would it be better for if they went by in groups and really uh, um, startle you? Or would it be best if they just went one after another for a week? Um, just think about that. That's hypothetical. Uh, and one of the concerns raised is that the noise of the jet ski uh, is a high frequency noise. And that does not travel great distances underwater. And thus, no warning is given to uh, marine mammals, birds, or fish that are under there. So there's the real um, danger that the jet skier won't know, and certainly the animal won't know, and will result in panic, displacement, abandonment, of feeding, or young, um, and of course, back again to the actual collision, as the uh, slide earlier showed. And do keep in mind that what, you know, one of the unique features about uh, a jet ski is that it can go close in. And it may be able to go into areas that a, ship, a boat has never even been in. And think of the wildlife. Um, air pollution, again, uh, back to uh, EPA meeting EPA standards. But again, as I uh, indicated, uh, there doesn't seem to be any acknowledgement that this is not a single jet ski, this is a group of jet skis who are racing. We are talking about a very big prize. Um, so, on the, there is a lot of wildlife, and just to um, be reminded of all the wildlife that could potentially be there and could potentially be affected. The adverse effect on um, wildlife is uh, pointed out. The coastline is intricate and complex. Uh, even boaters familiar with the area occasionally mistake uh, their location, especially in high seas or foggy weather. With potentially a thousand racers over 2,000 miles, how can all racers truly recognize and avoid uh, every national park, wildlife refuge, sea, lion, uh, haul out, bird rookery, and other sensitive habitat. Moreover, uh, under the race rules, participants must check in at each of the checkpoints, but they can go any old way they want to between the checkpoints as long as they go in the order of the, of the checkpoints. So there's no single route that uh, a thousand racers will be following, which, of course, obviously raises the possible uh, risk of incidents with animals and birds. So other comments that, um, uh, you know, or responses, I should say, uh, for mitigating, uh, attempts to mitigate, all the jet skiers they have, there will be mandatory, mandatory classes uh, probably here in Anchorage, um, or or elsewhere, I mean, it's 1,000 people that have to be accommodated, uh, in which they will be um, told about harassment, they'll be told about the state and federal laws that, that govern it. Uh, they will be given maps, which are being developed or have been developed with the resource agencies. Uh, and my understanding is there will be red, gold and red, yellow, and green, and red will be areas that they cannot go into, and yellow areas will be where you could go in, I guess, at lower speeds or caution or whatever, and green would be uh, wide open. Um, as was uh, mentioned in the trivia, a bit, the wet dog officials 
uh, will have a GIS technology to show where each jet ski has traveled. Um, they, each ski will have a, a satellite radio uh, transceiver on it, which will be broadcasting uh, every nine to 12 minutes. Uh, in addition to being able to be used to locate your favorite racer, uh, the sponsors also said, well, we will know if somebody causes a spill um, because you can track after the fact where X has been. So if a spill is spotted over here um, at, at some time, they can tell, uh, and they can identify which, uh, which team uh, left it. So if jet skiers break the laws or the rules, uh, they may be disqualified and they will lose, the team will lose uh, the 70,000, uh, 35,000 each uh, will be forfeited. But that depends on them being caught. And this is essentially self-enforcement uh, by the team. I mean, if they go through and disturb a, a rookery, uh, who will know? and who will report it. Um, the oil spill, uh, the other problem with this is that it's after the fact. This is not prevented, this is after the fact, but the damage has been done by that point. So, think again about where this race is being held, and up here are some uh, protected areas or concentrations of uh, animals are or birds are. Um, this is sensitive habitat, let's put it that way. Um, then think of some of the, some of the areas, locations that um, uh, possibly will be affected adversely. Uh, Kodiak, uh, Cook Inlet, uh, Ketchmack Bay, King Cove, Cold Harbor, uh, Iliamna. And as pointed out, uh, some of these areas have had uh, experience before, like, uh, I think it was like 10 years ago, the citizens of Homer uh, were upset enough to prevail to get jet skis banned in Catchback Bay State Park and Catchback Bay State Wilderness Park. Um, so jet skiers won't be going in there, um, but it, uh, it's a constant, uh, it's a constant threat. So I'd like to speak a little on water pollution. Uh, there are four quick but important points. Um, as indicated, the sponsor says 500 gallons per uh, jet ski. 500 times a thousand gives you 500 thousand, half a million gallons of fuel will have to be brought in to these uh, 23 checkpoints. Uh, be, it'll be brought in by barge, except for the three communities, I think they're just three that are uh, attached to the road system. Um, and the question will be, will there be spills in transferring the fuel from the barges to the storage tanks? Um, I am much less getting into the refueling issue. And I think in all practical terms, the major fishing ports handle, you know, a gazillion boats a year and hundreds of thousands of gallons and they have their drill down. That's not going to be the issue. It's going to be in these smaller checkpoints. Remember every jet ski, a thousand jet skis have to visit each of the checkpoints and they will get refueled. So the concern would be in the smaller places uh, do they have their um, act together? So then, then we get into the whole question of, so they're required to only refuel at the checkpoints. They are allowed to carry um, four, six gallons of cans. So 24 extra gallons uh, in between the checkpoints. Um, this, I, I do want to make clear, this is you know just a, a rule of thumb at best. But if it's a 15 gallon, if you have a 15 gallon 
jet ski, and you get four miles a gallon, which is, remember what the sponsor believes, um, each jet ski is going to need 500 gallons, it's 2,000 miles, that's four miles a gallon. So if you have a 15 gallon tank, you can go 60 miles. If you have a 20 gallon tank, you can go 80 miles. You will have this extra fuel, but you will have to refill um, your gas tank. And that's where the issue comes up. Um, because if you look at the checkpoints, they're not all neatly you know, 60 miles away or 80 miles away. They're further away. And so this rule of thumb, so if a 15 gallon tank, if you look at the checkpoints and, and do the mileage, I came up with, you would refuel 23 times between checkpoints. And if it's a, a 20 gallon tank, you go further, it would only be 13 times between checkpoints for the whole race. But we're talking about a thousand skis. So if you had, a, if they were all, had only 15 gallons, you're talking about 23 possible um, spill events, uh, seepage events. If it's 20 gallons, it's slightly less, but we're talking about 13,000 times uh, tanks on the jet skis will be refilled. And that raises the question, just before we get to this, as where, where will they do the refueling? Uh, they won't do it at the checkpoints, because that's when they'll fill up. They'll, they'll do it, they can do it at sea, I understand. Uh, will they do it on the uplands? Will they stop? How will they do this? Remember, we're talking 13 times or 23 times um, uh, uh, between the checkpoints. Um, and uh, so let's let's go to uh, another possible area that we should be concerned about is that the two-stroke uh, jet ski uh, requires a uh, that they mix their oil and their gas according to their own formula. Uh, so anyone and and two-stroke jet skis are permitted in this. But it's real clear the owner will have to do, the, the jet ski operator will have to do his own mixing. And again, can this be done at sea and what does that uh, 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 entail? Uh, and the fourth point is the rules require that each jet ski have a oil uh, uh, a spill response kit which consists of absorbent pads and uh, container with a good top on it so you can put the pads in. They are required to spill, to clean up any spill. Uh, and if they can't, then they have to call for assistance and wait for that assistance to come. Um, and I guess clean it up before they can leave or at least uh, that outside assistance has to come. Um, and again, just think this is a race with two million bucks uh, at stake. And um, so, uh, and nor do I, uh, how long will spill remain on the ocean? I mean, if there are a lot of waves, I would think it would be gone instantly. Um, so, will this ever be reported? Will, will people ever stop? So there is, um, there we go. <laughs> the slide sums it up. So other concerns that were raised is the adverse effect, uh, uh, impact on the checkpoint communities. Um, that are going to feed, house, toilet, refuel, and harbor the racers. Again, thousand ski and the skiers have to go into each checkpoint, regardless of um, of the size. Um, if they all came, in, if they came, if they stayed in the original waves when they go out, that would be 210 racers coming in at one time. Now. How many communities can feed, uh, house, have uh, outhouses, restrooms for uh, 210 folks um, at a time? Uh, and also, I point out the rules require that there be a mandatory uh, rest time of 32 hours between before they get to Kodiak and another 32 hours after they leave Kodiak. That's mandatory downtime. 
So there's got to be places for folks to sleep. So it's not, uh, people are not running 24 hours a day. The sponsor has indicated that uh, each community has been contacted and that there is proper infrastructure uh, in place to support the race. Um, the sponsor also indicates that the uplands, uh, whether it's owned by the feds or the state, uh, will only be accessed for an emergency. That eating, resting, restroom use, and refueling will all take place only at the checkpoint. I think some skepticism is uh, warranted uh, with that with that claim. They are teaching a uh, leave no trace guideline as part of the man, uh, mandatory uh, training sessions before, um, and of course, then a big issue raised by all kinds of folks were safety. Um, DNR and the sponsor essentially disclaim any and all responsibility related to the race and the racers. DNR describes its role as to responsibly develop Alaska resources by making them available for maximum use and benefit consistent with, public, with the public interest. We're back again to what is the public interest. Each rider does have safety gear. Uh, they'll have a satellite phone. They'll have uh, two-way marine uh, radios. Uh, they have a personal locator beacon. They have to use their own GPS uh, systems. They're required to carry out a sleeping bag and tent and food for two days and extra and a gallon of water or so um, and cooking pots just in case they do wash up on shore. And the 110 boats uh, that will be hired and located throughout their purpose is to conduct um, um, any rescue or, or emergency uh, work required. So the sponsor is vowed there will be no public funds or public resources used for emergencies on this race. I think, again, a little skepticism is, uh, uh, should be in place for this. So, any questions? And we put up a number of questions that people might, might have. Um, no. There's an incredible number of people involved to do that. There is reference in, in uh, some of the material uh, that these will be volunteers, except for the hired boats. But uh, whether that, I mean, that was two years ago when you first did that. Yeah? So, are they going to only be spending the night and sleeping in the checkpoints, or are they going to be camping on beaches? Well, the, theoretically, they will only be at the checkpoints. But uh, if you recall a couple years ago, you may remember the publicity, one of the uh, uh, exploratory trips they did um, with a small group of people, and they ended up being stranded for three days on the Alaska Peninsula, uh, camping in extreme weather where they couldn't get a fire, keep a fire going, that kind of thing. So. I think they're going to be on the uplands. I think mean, it's inevitable. Weather is too fierce. Yeah, Susan, did you say when they take off from Whittier, the, the start will take five days? Yeah, because they're going to go in waves. Um, three waves of 35 teams a day. So that's 210 people a day, and you're talking about 1,000. So you get 4.7 days, or, so I'm saying it's five days. And that's going every two minutes, and it's as if everybody's lined up to do that. Um, so presumably, then, as they go to the different communities, those communities will get those 200 people each day, yeah. supposedly, but of course yeah. it's going to be weather and problems. Right, right, then, yeah. yes. So there could be fewer or many more at any one time. Yeah. Is there any indication that they're actually going to get a thousand people to sign up for this at thirty-five thousand dollars a month? Don't know. Don't know. I think the logistics are such that they really need that kind of income uh, to support this thing. It, it's a little chicken and eggy. Um, Is 
the the Coast Guard has authority over water, uh, mm -hmm. the ocean. Are they not going to have any involvement or what have they their approach? Um, I, I really don't. My understanding is that they uh, do need to get a permit from the Coast Guard, but it's a very general uh, work-a-day kind of permit, nothing very special. Uh, and in all the comments, uh, the Coast Guard, there was not a comment from the Coast Guard. So um, I don't know, but that's just my understanding. It's, it's not a very severe permit hurdle to get. I understand that TSAC Legends uh, release 25% or so of their gasoline is unburnt and goes right into the water as part of their exhaust. Well, there's, and I don't really so understand it. There's a difference. Uh, the, the only two cycle that now can be used uh, have to meet the EPA standards, and so it's fuel injected rather than the other kind. I, and I may have this wrong, so that there is less of it, uh, of the gas going right into the to the water. But I don't know the details. Less, but it can't be zero because yeah. the, you know fires right. at every. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No. No. More. More possible pollution. Yeah. <clears throat> so on when, these five days when they're going to be leaving Whittier, mm -hmm. what about the fishing boats and you know if there are any sightseeing boats and does everybody else just have to stay home for five days? I. Uh, that's that's a good question. Now they did choose. Uh, this period, starting May 1st and so the first 10 days of May, on the grounds that there was less activity going on in terms of the fishing season really hasn't gotten started, uh, tourism is not that, that big, and uh, so there would the 110 boats would be available and people would be hot to, to lease them for this purpose. Um, I don't know how yeah, that's I calculated, you know, three and a half hours a day, uh, each day in the harbor would be, uh, these uh, jet skis would be going out. I don't know how that all will be managed. Yes? Um, I think they're barging them back. They, that's part of the entry fee is to get your, uh, you will get your jet ski back. Um, how they do that, I don't know. Yeah, Joan. Um, the point in the question, um, I think it's important to note too that this race is being um, advertised internationally. Yeah. And so, even though I think it's ridiculous and unlikely to happen, I also imagine that there's plenty of people around the world who are wealthy enough to do this and they won't know any better. They won't know that how impractical this is. Um, and if experience um, of foreign climbers at Mount McKinley is, you know, is um, yeah. to prove to this, it's the foreign climbers have a very different environmental ethic and they don't understand the language so are not going to understand all the safety warnings who are, I'm not McKinley at any way, right, that the um, foreign climbers have a disproportionate number of uh, injuries, death, accidents, and um, environmental issues as well right, that's, not that's the regulations. Very much to the point, and uh, the sponsor does acknowledge that, uh, and it certainly is, this is, he does want the foreign uh, competitors, because that's where uh, the money is, and to make this, uh, the race, the kind of world-class race that he wants it to be. Uh, and he boasts on his site about he's heard from this country, that country, or racers in, in there. He also acknowledges that they, uh, that one reason for the mandatory classes is because people would be coming uh, from a different uh, environment and, and understanding and that this would be a good way to teach them about American laws. But do we want to be the guinea pig? Yeah. Um, and my question is, do you know if any uh, reality TV producers are interested? <laughs> I would assume they're swarming over this idea, but I don't know. Yeah. 
Do you know of any other instances where lethal trace guidelines are trying to be applied to internal combustion engine events? Say again, I didn't get the first part. Well, I've never heard of lethal trace being combined with motorized. Oh, I, th I think it is uh, theoretically if they end up having to camp on the shore. Great. Well, thank you much. Wait, oh, 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 sorry. Um, just related to the amount of money people are putting into this potentially if it happens and the, the, um, the communities along the checkpoints, what do they stand to gain? They would have to get some economic gain from that, would they not? They're not expected to volunteer their services and infrastructure. No. No, so that, I wonder and how they felt about it given the well, potential economic opportunity for them. If you look at the 12 comments that were in favor, um, there were four people from one small community who had some commercial interest, and I believe the rest are all from Chamber of Commerce, who um, are eager to have this. They, they're saying not much is going on, this would give a boost to the community, and in fact, um, uh, Mr. Lane promoted it as being an uh, economic boost uh, to small communities and large at that, at that time. Um, room and board um, is paid for as part of the uh, entry fee, uh, so how they're going to do this with the communities, I don't know, but they, I would hope they would be contracting uh, with small entities to provide this. Uh, the logistics, though, just boggle my mind. I mean, people are going to be coming for breakfast 24 hours a day. <laughs> how, how is anybody going to be ready to... Uh, provide 20 people at a time at, you know, 3 in the morning. I just don't, I don't get it. But anyway, it's going to be done. So it would be through uh, contracting, for, I think, for the room and board. Uh, and of course, the fuel um, will be paid for to the harbor master or whatever. Yes? Um, I was wondering, has uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service had any public response to this? Yes. Yes. Um, they, in fact, urged, well, one of the things they urged was that the race be uh, scheduled like two weeks later um, because of the speckled eider, um, that kind of thing. They are concerned about uh, spill and uh, on refuge and entry onto refuge land and, of course, then uh, the effects on birds and wildlife. Did you say that there was kind of a uh, dry run a, a few years ago? Well, they, uh, my recollection is they did two uh, dry runs with, with just a handful of people um, and to see how it would work. Uh, and they didn't get you know all that far. And actually, they went down Cook Inlet rather than uh, out in the Gulf of, uh, uh, out in Prince William Sound. Um, but they. Uh, seem to be satisfied. I, I don't know if it would be interesting to see if they're going to do, try to do more dry runs uh, this summer, because this would be the time to do it. So when is the race, the first race going to occur? Next May 1st. Next May. Yeah. And no one has ever done this route previously, no. ever, yeah. especially the whole route. Uh, I would, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a general. Yeah. Yeah, jet ski crossing uh, Shallowcroft Strait. Straight. Look, yeah. Twice. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Are there are there jet ski races this long in other countries? You said there weren't in the United States. But. I haven't. Um, I don't know that. But I I would say no because it's being promoted as the longest endurance race in the world. There are jet skis in Dubai. Uh, races in Dubai and. I think Indonesia, um, so forth. But um, those are warm places, warm oceans compared. Um, but I don't know the length. But I think I think not. If the longest race in this country is 300 uh, miles, and it's touted as the longest endurance race, um, I would assume that there are not many that are much beyond that. Great.